Hello and welcome to The Debrief. I'm Seth Ressler. I'm Becky Scarcello. And this is the show where we meet the creatives who are shaping Detroit. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I like to, <laughs> I, like, yes. I like some animation in it. Uh, here's the thing. Today we're going to talk about representation. Us two white people. Right. Well. Me, <laughs> me and my co-host, the white woman named Becky. I know. Uh, <laughs> Can you get more basic? Look, I'm going to be honest with you. As a white male, this is not something that I run into often. Right. Uh, there are plenty of white males in popular culture. I, I am Everywhere. very well represented. Yes. Uh, I ran into it recently because, you know, I, I, my girlfriend is black. Uh, her grandkids are black and they were over one day. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big sci-fi fan and I'm, you know, the, the girl's a teenager and that age. You want to share like, it? I'm like, oh, I want to get, get you all excited about this yeah. stuff. And there just isn't a lot of sci-fi with black women in it yeah. and even when there is it's kind of like the one and it's not the main character it's kind of, yeah, and it's just not in the, the background there or, isn't a lot of representation mm. uh mm -hmm. to the point where like i actually was going on amazon going okay i gotta find some books yeah. i gotta find some movies i gotta find something that's a little bit better well yeah. that's really important and we're going to talk about that today with our guest because uh she's a woman who found herself in a similar situation mm -hmm. right she's looking at pop culture she's saying you know they're there's not a lot of people that look like me. Right. Uh, or told my story. Or, or told my story or yeah. on the big screen. So uh, we're going to talk about how an Iraqi American woman uh, took her story and it turned it, first of all, into a book yep. and is now turning into an indie film for the Amazing. first time. Yeah. Uh, our guest today is Wiam Nemu. She is an award-winning author, filmmaker, and journalist. She's also the executive director of the uh, Chaldean Cultural Center over in West Bloomfield. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. So <laughs> yeah. So let's, um, can you set the scene for us? Tell us the premise of your novel and upcoming film, Pomegranate. Well, it's about um, a liberal Muslim woman who lives across the street from a conservative Christian, a Chaldean. And it was uh, the premise for it. I had the idea during the 2016 elections. There was a lot of tension going on everywhere, but particularly uh, between the Chaldean community uh, as they are Christians and the Muslim community. And um, I don't know if the audience knows this, but uh, Michigan has the largest uh, population of Iraqi born, uh, Iraqi born residents in the United States. And so this was kind of, there was a lot of tension going on. Um, and I thought, you know, there was a lot of noise out there. I thought, let me take, all of this, what's happening, and create a story out of it. Like, do something productive. Um, and so I wrote this um, story from the version of a liberal Muslim woman. Um, and they, they live across the street, and there's a lot of humor in the story. And it's, it's a very authentic Iraqi-American story, which, by the way, you were talking about the movies that are out there. Um, during the pandemic, my husband and I spent a lot of time watching Netflix, like everybody else started doing yeah. And I could not find a single Iraqi American film. Now, uh, Netflix has a huge selection of Arab uh, films, mm -hmm. the, a category for Arab films, which are really great, but none of them are made by Iraqi filmmakers. There's from Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, all over the world. And I, I really did not even realize that it was that bad, that our voices were not heard to that extent. Mm. So, um, and this was already after Pomegranate has been out there. The, the script was selected final um, quarter finalist by Francis Coppola Zoetrope. So I was very proud of that. And uh, recently, uh, Scott Rosenfeld, the, the producer of Home Alone and Mystic Pizza, he became the executive producer of this uh, film. Wow. So we're very, very excited. So that means, you know, and, and we're hoping to start shooting by the end of the summer, early fall. That's awesome. That is amazing. Yeah. So did you set out to be such a trailblazer? What from your experience kind of inspired you to do this? Well, I always knew that I was going to write books. Um, I mean, I don't know if I, from age 19, at least I knew I was going to write books and I set out to do that. Um, what I was surprised is that um, the lack of books that were authentic from Iraqi, well, Arab Americans in general, but particularly by Iraqis and even less by women. Um, so when I once I decided um, to be a writer shortly afterwards, when I saw the stereotype and the lack of Iraqi American artists, I decided that my stories would be like 
even the ones that are considered novels and fiction, but they're all based on true stories, really. Um, and they're kind of autobiographical. So, I mean, I could use myself as one of the main characters and bringing some of the things that I don't necessarily live through, you know, one year, but through my lifetime and kind of play around with it. And the reason I purposely did that is because there is a void. There's a void in the area that I feel responsible to fill because if we're not going to tell our stories, somebody else who doesn't know what they are will. Um, mm -hmm. And as a woman, this is especially important for me as a mom. Uh, I have a son and a daughter, and I want my children to see authentic stories of themselves out there, whether through books or films. Yeah, it's a, it's an important to see yourself in, reflected in a true way in, in culture. I yeah. mean, instead of just left out of the narrative. What would you say that might not be there if somebody else who didn't have your background wrote your story? I yeah, mean, what, stereotypes yeah, and things. Yeah, what are the things that you want to make sure come through? Well, the women are always placed as victims. Um, mm -hmm. During my career as a writer and a filmmaker, I was always by um, the industry, the publishing and the film industry. They always tried to gear me to write things that I could not relate to. Like, write about honor killing. It'll be a bestseller. I don't know anything uh, about honor killing. So yeah, and it then, wasn't you. And to, yeah. to, <laughs> and to top it off, that's like goes against what I'm trying to do here. Um, but that was the message. It was like, uh, if you're, you know, we want diverse voices, but we want them the way we see them to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So if you don't fit into that diversity, then you're not really that what you're looking for. And that really was a shocker over time because I feel like given, you know, they said that we want ethnic voices, diverse voices, and I feel like I f fall into all these categories, but I don't fall into the category of the victim, um, Middle Easterner. We have our issues like everybody else, but none of the women in my stories are victims. They just have their own challenges. And so these two main characters, the two women, both the Christian and the Muslim has their own challenges they have to overcome. But, you know, they have strong personalities, they're beautiful women, and they can carry their own. Nice, nice. So mm -hmm. the the book, you wrote this novel, you got writing down, you have what, 13 books under yeah, your this was my belt. 14th book. 14 yes. books under your belt. So I haven't read 14 books. <laughs> <laughs> He's too busy watching Netflix. Right. Um, so you had that down. Which is good. <laughs> right, I mean, we all have our things. Um, but how do you go about, hey, how do we make this a movie? Did someone come to you? What was the process? Well, the process was um, Actually, because I decided that this was going to be directed by me. I had directed a feature before, which won two international awards. It was a documentary, though. Um, so it's called The Great American Family. And that, too, was a book that I made into a feature okay. documentary. It won two international awards. The book got won an Eric Hoffer Award. Um, it was optioned by an L.A. producer. It's still optioned today. And um, the documentary was picked up by Jeff Porter in uh, Beverly Hills, California. And so even though I've never um, directed a feature film, like a narrative, but who would know a story like this more than me, especially yeah. about not only is it because of the community, but as women. And, you know, I've had um, people that I worked with, like including men that were very helpful for me, but then they will try to like make these changes. And I'm like, no, an Iraqi girl would never say that. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and imagine if a director came, it will just change it. Um, you know, one thing that Scott Rosenfeld said when he read the script, he said that he knew that, that he was going to like the premise and he saw that there was a lot of uh, value in the story, but he was not expecting to laugh so much. And the reason that he was able to laugh is because really this story is authentic. It's just like uh, Tyler Perry, when he writes about his community, he can say things that he lived through that yeah. we would not really be able to say it that way with kind of a lot of love. And, you know, so he's talking about himself and his community and it comes out different. And I just feel like we, we're not given that opportunity to do that. Um, and maybe that's even a wrong way of saying it. I don't know that we need to be given an opportunity. We live in this great country that, like, if you want to find a way, you will find a way. You don't have to wait for anybody's permission. So. Oh, well, I like that answer. All right. I'm going to make some changes around here. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sorry. I'm gonna get myself into trouble. <laughs> well, you seem to me that you you kind of take challenges head on. But what were some of these obstacles that you encountered? Can you get more specific about things you came up against? Oh yes. Um, well, yeah, a lot of rejections and rejections and you know, getting two top New York agents and then getting to the editorial board and always being told that, you know, my story doesn't really fit into that. It's not really marketable. It's not. Um, and I just, I, I know that the stories were good. And the, the proof of that is the awards that I have won yeah. and the, and what I've been able, you know, I, I had to find my own way in order to stay true to what I was trying to do. And that was a huge, huge struggle. Um, and in my community, um, you know, the arts and culture, I can't really say that we're strong in that area, which we're strong in family and faith and businesses, but not in arts and culture. Uh, And a lot of that is due that we come from a war-torn land. So we have been on survival mode for a long time. Mm -hmm. And arts and culture is a luxury. And that luxury has not been pampered and nurtured enough. And so I felt myself that I have that desire and that love, but I was so alone in my community. And then I felt misunderstood or not commercial enough in the Western um, industry. But then all that really looking back didn't matter because there was the people that picked out what I was, understood what I was doing and they kept their eye on me and they nurtured me and they stayed after me and they made sure that, it, you know, if I fell, they picked me back up and I, I owe so much to them. I will never, ever forget them. They're in my books. They're in my hearts. Um, and, you know, and I have a lot of faith in God and I knew that that's just my path. So I was trying to stay true to that. But it's really the people that I'm surrounded by that understood where I came from, what were my struggles as a woman in this community and just held sacred ground for me to make sure that um, that I get you know, to talk the way I'm talking today, because that's right. not how yeah. I feel. <laughs> so I owe a lot of gratitude for them. And I do try to pay in any which way I can. Yeah. So. All right. Well, we've got one last question we want to ask you before you go. Hope you're ready. William Namu, uh, who is an award-winning author, filmmaker, and journalist, also the executive director of the Chaldean Cultural Center. Uh, We want you to name a Detroit creative that everybody should know. Well, Ishtar Restaurant in Sterling Heights. If um, you go into that restaurant, you will feel like you're in Iraq. There is uh, art that is made by a local Assyrian artist. That is beautiful art and also the way they cook and um, they have somebody that comes out and pour w- with a traditional outfit that pours traditional tea and traditional Iraqi cups. So you really feel that you're like visiting Iraq. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had Iraqi food. I want to go try I know, that. I want yeah. the tea now. Right. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm all about it. So, well, well uh, you guys can come over anytime, okay? Yeah. Thank you so nice. much. Give me a call. I'll cook for you guys. Oh, my right. God. Okay, you're on. <laughs> so I know that you're just at the beginning of the filmmaking process, but people can read the book now. The book is called Pomegranate by William Namu. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really enjoyed having you. And sharing your story. Thank you. This was my first interview for this book, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, Oh, you're fantastic. Thank Thank you. you. That's it for us. I'm Seth Ressler. I'm Becky Scarcella. Remember, you can get the show in any number of places, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. You can find the video. We have a mobile app, or you can ask Alexa. Until next time, Detroit's moving. Keep up. 